Yeah, I, I, well, so we have one of our sayings. We have a, we have a few sayings, and one of the sayings that is held dear to the culture of Paul Mitchell is "We before me, we before me." Mm -hmm. And sometimes you'll see hashtags "We before me." And What's happening, everybody? Welcome back. It's another episode of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, and I am joined again by Chris Rappold. Chris, thanks for coming back. Oh, it's my you know, pleasure. I, I don't, I don't, I think we're running these pretty close together, if I remember correctly. And, and to the audience, if, if you don't know the behind the scenes, you know, we record and then episodes don't always air in order, right? We're, 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 there's a lot of things that we're, we're trying to account for. But when you and I talked, and I know that your interview episode is going to come out first. When you and I talked, we left out such a huge part of your relationship to the martial arts that I said, well, we've got we've to bring you back because, not just because of, I, we're going to get into some cool stuff, but I felt like we left part of you off the table, so to speak. Okay. And so, of course, I am talking about your relationship with team John Paul Mitchell. Mm, yeah, that's a, it's a, certainly an important part of uh, the journey for me. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, 30 uh, right now, this we're going to be going into our 38th year um, with the sponsorship uh, 2025. Right. So it's I've been and how doing long have you been involved uh, so for 38 years. Okay, you've been there. You were there at the beginning. Yeah, I, I, which, they, I was, which is crazy because you're 35, right? I mean, yeah, I right. Uh, I was picked up at the end of the first year, okay. uh, which was, which was wonderful. And, uh, mm -hmm. and here's what I'll say about that, uh, because I'm not the best martial artist in the world. There are people that can, you know, punch stronger and kick faster and, you know, do all of those things. I truly, and I, and I don't think it's falsely modest. I had the good fortune of being born in uh, New England and mm. the team had its origin about 35, 40 minutes from where I live. It started out as a regional team. And at the time I had the good fortune of competing against the original members of the team. Some of them, you know, we kind of came up together. Had I been born in Oregon, uh, mm. I'm not sure I would have had that good fortune. So, yeah. you know, a lot of it is, you know, does go to right place, right time. Yeah. And then a and, lot of work. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right. Oh, ab absolutely. Now I am, I'm old enough to, to be able to make this statement and, and, for, for people who have come up through the competitive side of martial arts more recently, or there's happened to be younger, it is easy to forget that 30 to 40 years ago, martial arts competitions were a lot more regionalized and you absolutely had a few hotbeds and new England was definitely one of them. Yeah. We, you know, we, and we've had a lot of guests on the show, whether, whether or not they've come through the team, yeah. the team, right. We're talking yeah. about John Paul Mitchell. And, and to those of you out there, maybe, maybe you're not big followers of the, the competitive side of martial arts. You might be scratching your head saying, I think I know that name. And I don't think it has anything to do with martial arts. You need to be right. And we're going to talk about that. Mm. But you were, you were about to tack on to what I was saying about that regional side. You know, we were, New England was known as region 12. And I think unbiasedly, I think, you know, anybody from that era would say, yeah, Region 12 had some amazing people come out of it that went on to national acclaim, certainly. And uh, I, again, to be able to cut my teeth, you know, on and, you know, against those people and you know, be team, team members alongside them, to be able to train with them, to be able to be taught by them. Um, you know, extraordinary, extraordinary. Now, yeah. now when you say region 12, I, I, this, because this goes back to when 
when I was younger, so I, I don't quite have the memory. Mm -hmm. Are you talking about specifically AKL, PKL? Uh, I believe or, it was. Were the, were the regions the same for other circuits? The, re, the region breakdown. This was, was the na this was the national circuit, and I want to say it was Karate Illustrated at the time had separated okay. us into regions. In New England was considered Region Twelve, New York Region Eleven. It might have been New York and New Jersey Region Eleven. Um, yeah. So no, I, I know AKL PKL also did that, and those those were the same numbers. And the only reason I know that okay. is because I just rehung my plaque the other day, <laughs> and I knew it at one time. But I mean, it's been you know thirty years since I looked at what the what the regions were. That'd actually be fun for me to look back. Oh yeah, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Okay. So I want to, I want to talk about that right place, right time. Talk, tell me, tell me that story. You said you got picked up the end of the first year. You were, you were competing against some of the, the team members. Yeah. How, did, how did this all happen? Sure. So, um, I was, I was an up and coming competitor. Um, I got my start with, uh, Billy Blank, who at the time was, uh, you know, a multi-time world champion, considered one of the best in the world. Um, and uh, it was after the Atlantic team started. And, you know, the Atlantic team, for the listeners that might not know, the Atlantic team, I would, uh, I would, I would say it was the dream team. It was the Michael Jordan. It was the Larry Bird. It was the Magic Johnson. It was the first time that, uh, you know, a national team with the very, very best all got put together. And it was, you know, very much an unbeatable team, much like the dream team was, you know, with Bird, Magic, and, uh, and uh, Michael. So I was competing alongside them. And uh, it was Don Rodriguez and Steve Babcock that had started a regional team called Spider Brand. I don't know if you remember that name, but Spider Brand was a uh, was a martial arts supply company, a local martial arts supply company, and they put together a regional team. And uh, uh, the gentleman, I believe his name was Bernie. Uh, was sponsoring this local team to, to give himself exposure. And I think as the story goes, they were up in Canada and spider brand didn't secure the hotels, didn't have the registrations all taken care of. And, and the spider brand team was up in Canada with no money to be able to compete, uh, as it was promised. And, uh, the, you know, it's not team. what you want to see out of out of a company that is supposed to be about money and logistics, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I don't I don't know the story. Uh, you know, certainly nobody's above having a, a run of bad luck or whatever. We so I, I yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't I don't have any insight into what it was. I never inquired. But so you had these this group of region 12 competitors and they had a team and then they lost their team. So uh, Don Rodriguez and Steve Babcock, uh, both from Rhode Island, uh, got together and they said, you know, what are we going to do about this team? And, you know, do you know of anybody that might be interested in picking up the sponsorship? So they talked back and forth and Steve Babcock said, you know, when I lived out in California, I used to rent a place uh, from a guy named John Paul, and he runs a company called Paul Mitchell. Now, for the listeners, there's this is a point of confusion. There's Paul Mitchell, <clears throat> and then there's John Paul de Joria, and they were co-founders of the company Paul Mitchell. And sometimes, so, so. Uh, Sometimes there's a level of confusion, and I'll, I'll jump into that in a second. But anyways, uh, Steve reached out to the person that he, he had struck up a relationship with when he was out in California. He started out renting uh, 
an apartment from him and then started mm -hmm. to teach his kids some karate in the garage and all that. And he said, I don't know if he'd be interested. So reached out to John Paul and John Paul said, you know, hey, you know, sounds kind of interesting. You know, why don't you write me something up and send it out to me and let me take a look at it. So he did. And a week or two later, they got a, their first check for $5,000. Now, the significance of that $5,000 back in, you know, 88, uh, you know, that was that was big money. We weren't we weren't sponsored by an oil team, as in the case of Atlantic or then later Trans World Oil. But $5,000 was still $5,000. And it was, oh, my goodness. And, you know, we're proud to say the start of the karate team sponsorship launched the entire sports marketing division for Paul Mitchell. So then what came after that, then it's the beach volleyball and it's the, um, it's the sponsor of Olympic athletes. It's, you know, the skiing and, you know, everything, everything started with the karate team. And, uh, and that's a source of pride for us because that was a major identity that the company took on for decades. So, I was competing um, against the, you know, the current Paul Mitchell members at the time. And I, I truly don't remember this, but Steve Babcock said I, I beat him in a tournament. But I, and again, I really truly don't remember it because I would have been a middleweight. He would have been a heavyweight. So it must have been in a grand championship. But, and, um, you know, competing and beating some of the other team members. And then at the end of the first year or the start of, I think the team was started halfway through the year. So that first year went into 89, but around January, February, I won the first two NASCA tournaments of the year, which gave me the number one spot in the country. And that's when I was picked up by the team. And, How old were you uh, at that time? I was 18, uh, 19? 18, 19 years old. Yeah. I was in, I was in senior year of high school or first year of college. Yeah. You know, somewhere there around. Yeah. You hadn't, you, so you hadn't started your school yet, right? We, we, no, 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 no. That. Yeah. No, You're not at all. Episode. Okay. Yeah. And you know, that afforded cool. me the opportunity through college mm. to travel the way that I did because, you know, being a college student, I, you know, came from a middle-class family. We weren't destitute in any, any sort of way. Uh, but did we, was there the extra money to fly all over, you know, the place as I was able to do? No. And, uh, you know, I remember in those early days, it was fun because, well, fun slash sometimes not fun because my team members who were early twenties, <clears throat> they'd be going out on Friday night and Saturday night. And, mm -hmm. you know, I'd be, I'd be unpacking my books and, uh, you know, doing my homework. So it's a little different. What was it like, you know, cause, cause now anybody who's attended a high level competition and, and, and any of the members of, of JPM showing up, it, there's, there's an acknowledgement, right? Everybody knows. And there's, mm -hmm. there's, there's some, I'm going to call it reverence. Mm -hmm. Um, there's simultaneously, depending on who the, the, the non team competitor is, there's a, oh man, as well as a, maybe a challenge. Like I'm going to rise mm -hmm. to the competition yeah. here because, because in, in here we are in 2024 and there are few people on other, on, on non JPM teams that I think people would look at and say, this is genuinely a top tier, you know, top of top mm -hmm. competitor, mm -hmm. right? The, the, mm -hmm. the way things flow now is when you reach that standing, this is where you go in the same way, mm -hmm. you know, we talked about the dream team, yeah. 92 basketball yeah. for those of you who are not fans. Sure. Sure. And, but what, but it wasn't like that at the, at the very beginning. Was it? No, no, it wasn't. There were other teams. You mentioned a couple of them that were very highly regarded. Oh, sure. Yeah, absolutely. And the, the big one out there, the, the Paul Mitchell of the day, <clears throat> uh, would have been the Trans World Oil team. Hmm. And, you know, they were, the, they were the team that just nobody could beat. Um, 
you know, they had, uh, they had Kevin Thompson and Billy Blanks and Steve Anderson and Tony Young and Richard Plowden and Terry Kramer and Anthony Price. I mean, that's, that's a formidable team. Uh, you know, Anthony Holloway was a part of that team. Um, oh, it's just so many. All names that have come up on this show a number of times. I'm, I, I'm sure, you know, the, my, you know, they were that decade before me, you know, uh, so they were my martial art heroes, um, in peers, but still they were, they were further along than, than we. Yeah. So, uh, eventually what it came down to, you know, Paul Mitchell continued to do well, uh, but we were much of a regional team and we ended up doing a challenge match against them in Michigan at the Dallas Auburn Hills where the Detroit Pistons play. It was a televised event. And we ended up, um, uh, you know, the main event that night was the team fight, us versus them. And uh, we ended up beating them, if I recall, 17 to 7. And the next day, um, Christine Bannon Rodriguez, who was a member of the Trans World team and the uh, the wife of Don Rodriguez, our coach, mm -hmm. uh, was <laughs> lost her position on Trans World Oil and became a, a Paul Mitchell team member. And uh, that, you know, she lost you, her position. Yeah. Well, Chuck is Merriman. That, that's that's. Yeah. No. In, Chuck, in both in both Christine yeah. and, and Chuck Merriman have been on the show. Yeah. Yeah. Chuck Merriman. Uh, 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 he was the coach, um, right? He was the coach, and uh, a an absolute, always a perfect gentleman to me. Uh, had done so much for our sport. He had been a legendary traditional martial art figure, but you know, it, you know, we became a rival, and it just so happened that Christine was on his team, and his rivals became Paul Mitchell, which was run by Christine's husband. So you know, I think it was just a a sensible parting of the ways that we can't have that. And, um, you know, and that's kind of the way it went. And that, that created the, that started the creation of the rival. Mm. And then many of those people that I named ended up finding their way uh, after trans world dissolved onto Paul Mitchell, because we, we kind of took their spot and, and we had the good fortune of a sponsor so, I know, want to go back to that, Please. that Michigan event because you're describing one team as big, dominant, and you're describing yeah. your team as not that. So going into it, you know, this, this outcome of 17 to 7, was that the opposite of what people were expecting? Oh, yeah. That were was you a, very clearly the underdogs here? Oh, clearly. Uh, you know, first of all, okay. it's in Michigan where – you know, my dear former teammate, Richard Plowden lives. Now I, I can't point to any bias and I don't mean to imply that, but you know, it would, you know, if Richard fought us in New England, you know, there may very well be a little, you know, bias because they're always used to seeing us compete. But yeah, no, it was a nobody, nobody anticipated that we would end up beating the team, but if you look at the people that we had out there, you know, they all went on, you know, everybody on the Paul Mitchell side, they all went on to, you know, be phenomenal in their own right. So who it was some just of the folks. Uh, it was some of those names? it was Steve Babcock, who's our co founder, and he was, uh, you know, a national champion. He had mm -hmm. fought, he had beat in his later years, he had beat Richard Plout and Terry Kramer. Uh, Anthony Price and, you know, whoever else, he had a number one spot in the country. There was John Payton, uh, who became a, 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 a national champion and, and one of the best fighters in the world. You know, the light John's heavyweight. come on the show. That was a great, that was a yeah. great episode. We've had um, uh, Alberto Montron. Alberto Montron won some of the biggest tournaments in the country, a very unorthodox fighter from... Uh, uh, Joe Pina's school, Joe Pina, Boston Taekwondo, mm -hmm. and has turned out some amazing 
champions over the years. You had myself, and then you had Pedro Xavier, who mm. most people would choose Pedro, if not the number one, but, you know, probably top three of all time. Yeah. So if you look at if you look at all of the people on our side, though we were a young team and young in our career, per se, compared to that, you know, that generation, you know, they had five to 10 years on us. We all went on to become top in the world in our respective divisions. Hmm. Yeah. So it was, uh, yeah, it just matched up well. You're using some language here that, that I want to point to because it's something I've observed and I'm sure you're very aware of it. You are constantly referring to this team as a we. Mm -hmm. And, you know, let, let's not forget martial arts, sparring, point fighting, whatever, whatever we, we choose to call it, martial arts competition. The majority of events, you know, these are individual events. And a lot of people look at their participation in a team as they are members of a team. They have an individual relationship with mm -hmm. their team. Mm -hmm. But I've never heard that, that I recall, mm -hmm. I've never heard that approach, that language from anyone on Team Paul Mitchell. It is always we, and I find that fascinating. Can you speak to that? Yeah, I, I will. So we have one of our sayings, we have, a, we have a few sayings, and one of the sayings that is held dear to the culture of Paul Mitchell is we before me, we before me. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you'll see hashtags, we before me, and as the executive director of the team, that is a, that is a cultural uh, standard that I constantly talk about in all of the Paul Mitchell meetings, you know, that I have the opportunity to run because it's, it's what, you know, you don't, you don't get 38 years without a culture of we before me. There, you know, you you're you're flattering, and and you know, statistically, certainly, you're correct that you know Paul Mitchell is the pinnacle that we've just we've been doing it longer, and there's just on sheer years, there's nobody that could touch the records, the world championships, the grand championships, etc., just because of the expanse of time. But we are not a team of superstars. There are, there are superstars on our team, but there's mm -hmm. a level of selflessness you have to have to be on our team. And if you don't have that, if you want to be, you know, an individual, you're going to probably lose your spot on the team mm -hmm. or you're going to quit the team mm -hmm. because... It's uh, uh, because of the way that we run it. Some people, really, really talented people, but they, they're, they're born with a, a mirror in front of them in their language. If you listen to them speak, not that they're better or worse than me or you, but you will hear, I, 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 I did this, I did that, I did this, I did that, I innovated that, I, I, I. And that, you know, to our culture, that's like nails down a chalkboard. We have, we, you know, currently we have three forms competitors on our team. And I'll just, I'll point to this to explain. We have uh, Ben Jones, we have Esteban Tremblay, and we have Dawson Holt. And they compete against each other. Hmm. And the only thing that they care about is that we take first, second, and third. Hmm. I have watched their facial expression close. And you're talking a thousand or two thousand dollar win for winning that grand championship. They are equally happy for each other, you know, and uh, and they work hard and they push each other. Like if if one of them decides not to train, the other one is gonna beat it. Uh, you know, is going to beat them at the next tournament. They ride. You know, see, the best part of competition is the the pushing towards your potential that 
you need. Uh, because when somebody, and again, that's not my forte, but when somebody jumps up in the air and does a, you know, a 1080 or whatever they do, I don't even know the names of it. It makes you number one, realize it's possible. And it gives you that impetus to say, okay, I got to figure out how to do that. And then what's the next thing off of that? So I think the competition at its best is a driver that unlocks Mm. your potential. Yeah. And, and if you want to be on the team, we celebrate our team's successes. Um, And, and that's it, you know, and, and, we're proud of our team members and let them humbly accept their, their win or their number one spot or whatever, but that's it. Yeah. Is this something that can be taught and, and cultured and coached or do they have to come in with this attitude? Well, we have the good fortune of watching competitors for a long period of time before they come on to our team. So I I would never put anybody on the team unless I've seen them win and unless I've seen them lose and unless I've heard how they handle both of those and seen it for myself and talked to them and understand their background and how they tick. And there's a vetting process. We have four people on our executive team that, that X-ray people up and down and it's a given that they're going to be the top in the world. So that's, that's the given. But the second part of it, which is not a, it's not a resume. It's, you know, getting to know the person, getting to know their instructor, you know, talking, talking to people. When I was first on the team, uh, and I'm talking, this was first or second tournament. It might've been the first fly tournament. Our team went uh, to an event and we're waiting out at baggage claim. And the promoter had sent a limousine uh, for our coach, Don Rodriguez. So, you know, the limousine pulls up and, you know, the whole team is waiting there and the limousine pulls up and the limousine for Don Rodriguez. And Don said, I have, I have my, you know, my team here. Well, we're only, we're only allowed to take you. And, you know, Don, especially in the early days, you know, had a temper and could get heated, but he was actually offended. Like, how dare you send a a limousine or transportation for me and not for my team? Thank you, but no thank you. And that's the start of teaching the we before the me. So can you teach it? Yeah, but it has to start with the example mm-hmm. that you set. And that's one of many, many examples I could tell you of small things that are done. Steve Babcock, the co-founder of our team, he put, this is before I was executive director, uh, this is years ago, when I was competing, he put Anthony Price, Terry Kramer, and Richard Plowden on the team. Well, those were his greatest rivals. He put them on the team because we wanted to have the best team in the world, and they were top in the world. Kevin Thompson was not on our team. Pedro Xavier was asked, should we put Kevin on our team? Now, Kevin and Pedro were the Mm. height of their rivals. And Pedro didn't hesitate. Of course, of course, put him on the team. Are you kidding me? It wasn't, there wasn't even a flicker of, well, you know, how is that gonna, you know, what's that gonna do to my win record? Or wait a minute, this is my rival. Like it's, are you kidding me? So, You know, there's three examples, one from a coach and two from pillars of our team. And that creates the lore, that creates the stories, and those stories are continually told and reinforced, you know, by myself and the executive team so that as new people come on the team, 
they understand, you know, the expectations. And again, if you want to be a superstar and if you want to talk I, 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 or you want to be, you want to get on Paul Mitchell as a resting place and just, you know, kind of cocoon yourself around the fact that you have Paul Mitchell on your back, you're not going to like it very much because what people don't realize is as soon as you put that on your back, you might as well be walking around with a bullseye Mm -hmm. because now people are training to beat you. People are doing film study on every single move you do and they're breaking everything down and they're, you know, there's psychological games that are played and, and sometimes you're being put on in front of somebody else that wanted to get on the team. So now there's that, you know, so, and a lot of times people don't think through, you know, those things in the decision are you really ready to handle that level of pressure uh, to be able to, um, you know, to rise up and, uh, you know, live with that day in and day out. Yeah. It's my, my suspicion, you know, and, and, and I, I think you've pretty much already confirmed this, but I, I want to lay this out there because I want, I want the folks out there to recognize that, you know, we often talk about the white belt mindset, right? Um, Shoshin, this idea that you can continually learn and the culture, as I understand it here, so wonderfully exemplifies that this idea that, you know, would you rather be the big fish in the small pond or would you rather be in the bigger pond? Would you rather have all the other big fish around you because you're going to help each other get better and you're going to reach, you know, bigger heights. What's more important? Is it the trophy at the end of the day or is it becoming the best that you can be? And that is an approach that you can bring into everything, whether it's martial arts or not, whether it's your martial arts school or a competitive team. And I'm, I'm not going to name the name. You'll probably know who I'm talking about because I, I've not been given permission to share any of this publicly, but somebody that I know, somebody in my circles spent some time as a high level competitor and was from what they've described, uh, frequently invited to Rhode Island to train with the team as someone who was very good. And, and um, what, what I heard coming out of those stories was the real world practice of everybody is pushing each other. They are sparring together. They are riding that line of challenge, you know, push and wanting to win and wanting to do your best and make your partner better and just barely not crossing that line of hitting too hard, being a bad teammate, et cetera, like really dialed in on that line. Yeah. And, and also too, (laughs) I would be lying if I told you that that's an easy line to maintain. I think that takes a tremendous personality. Uh, There was, (laughs) there was one time, uh, you know, Alberto Montron and I, and it's, it's a, it's a funny story. We were, we were competing and, the match didn't matter because we were both going to make the United States team. So I understood, just go out and you guys just go out and fight. It doesn't matter who wins, just go out and fight. Alberto understood it as, you know, just go out and play. It doesn't matter. Mm. So I went out and fought him and I, beat him significantly. And Alberto and I, we always traded matches back and forth. He beat me, I beat him. You know, I don't know who, doesn't really matter. Well, anyways, on that match, I beat him 11 to two. (laughs) Mm. And it was a source at the time of, Chris, what did you do? What are you doing? And I came off the stage like, what? We were just, said, go out and fight. And, you know, apparently there was a mixed message. So anyways, he was understandably upset. That's and I was to lose 11 to two. Yeah. And I was, what? <laughs> you know, so anyways, you know, 
so there was this heat and this tension. And I remember, and this truly happened, John Rodriguez grabbed both of us and put us in a hotel room and said, I don't care what you do to each other. Don't come out of the hotel room until it's resolved. Hmm. <laughs> if you guys want to beat each other up, if you want to talk it out, like, I'm going to wait outside of this door and you guys don't come out until it's done. And, uh, and we did. And again, that's, that's, how did you, you know, resolve it? That's a life lesson. I don't really remember. Uh, but the point is Alberto and I, uh, I, there is nobody I have more respect for, you know, he's, he's a brother. We, we traveled, after that happened, we traveled all over the world together. Uh, you know, we fought side by side each other. You know, he's an ambassador right now for the United States um, and, you know, has a very high political position. Uh, I haven't seen him in, I don't know, seven to ten years. And, and we'll hit each other up on Facebook from time to time. He is a lifelong friend that if he needed something at four in the morning, I'd I'd be there for them, you know, but <clears throat> you, you have those kind of struggles and to the best of our ability, we try to, if, if there is those tensions that happen, you know, you, you isolate it and you work it out and, you, you know, you find your way through and, you know, that just, that has to be done. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How did you become executive director? Ah, you know, the times change and my coach, who's been the only coach I've ever had, Don Rodriguez, because I got picked up on the team when I was 18 or 19, you know, times change. And <clears throat> there was a, um, a vice president of global sports marketing from Paul Mitchell, um, kind of recognized that for our team to realize its potential, we need more, we need more depth <clears throat> of information and insight. And the job was getting bigger with the team's, you know, successes and stuff. Then it was bigger than what she felt that both Don and Steve could do themselves. Mm -hmm. And she wanted to amplify the power of the team. Now, she had the foresight on that that we all did. And I don't even think Don and Steve at the time did. But those two single-handedly ran the team for, you know, 20 plus years, 25 years. I, and doing what I do now, it's like, I don't even know how the heck they did it. So she put these people together and said, you know, hey, work as a team and figure this out. You're now all equal, equal say in the team. And for the first year or so, it was, we, we had, even though we all knew each other, we weren't quite sure how to work with each other and, and highlight each other's strengths. So I came to her about a year later and asked her, I said, you know, could, could I have your permission to take a, a lead on this and let me see if I can create a level of structure. And that structure never would have happened if it wasn't for the faith, the trust, the friendship of uh, Don Rodriguez and Steve Babcock enabling me to hold that position. And uh, that was 2011, 2012. And I've, you know, had that position since then. And it's just been a wonderful experience because each of us on the team, we bring something, we bring something different to it. That's what a team you know? should be. Yeah. And, and, you know, here, here's again, we before me yeah. and strengths is, you know, there's nobody that knows stats like Don Rodriguez. I mean, if you ask him about a match 15 years ago, it, this gymnasium, he'll tell you the score and what the last point was that won. He's the one that could tell you 
And he's the one I really have to give credit to because all I've known is Paul Mitchell. So mm. I have limited viewpoint. I don't have an outside viewpoint on who we are. I just, I've been involved in it. Uh, but he's the one I really have to give credit to for continuing to remind us, guys, do you know what we're doing here? Do you know, you know, we're the first team that had trading cards. We've had a monopoly game made about us. We, we, you know, and he'll list, you know, the amount of grand champions and the amount of world champions and the, you know, and it's, you know, him beating us over the head with that in his own way for years got us to believe, you know, it's even something bigger and more special. He got us to believe in, this is about JP's legacy, you know, because what do you buy a, you know, person who's worth $7 billion or whatever he's worth, you know, what do you, he, 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 what am I going to do, buy him a tie? But when you're talking about being the person or one of the people responsible for his contribution and legacy to sport karate, well, now there, there's a different level of behavior that goes with that. Mm. Uh, you know, Steve Babcock, he brings a, he brings a perspective that, you know, that I don't have doing it for so many years. Our fighting coach, Damon Gilbert, um, has been there, done that. He, he has beaten everybody on the planet during his day, you know, always considered, you know, probably one of the best fighters ever. His fighting IQ is extraordinary. Uh, the, his ability to be able to break down people. And then not on our executive team, but uh, our forms coach is Jackson Rudolph. And, you know, Jackson has, you know, he's seen it, done it, you know, understands it. Uh, and his, you know, social media expertise, you know, because of his age, dwarfs all of ours, you know, my coach still uses a yellow legal pad, you know, that's his computer. I uh, still has a flip phone, believe it or not. So we needed, you know, we needed somebody with that level of expertise, you know, so, and none of us are perfect, uh, particularly Don and Steve, they've seen me at my worst. Uh, they've seen me at my best and I've seen them at their worst and their best. And we love each other. We recognize our faults and we recognize the faults in each other. And we're all super respectful of that. We all recognize what our limitations are. I recognize as the executive director, the way I bring a message to Coach Damon is different to how I talk to Coach Steve or, you know, Coach Don Rodriguez. It's everybody is an individual and everybody has to, you know, you have to be able to meet them where they're at. And, and like any human being walking the earth, we all have a level of ego. We all want to feel important. It's true. Uh, to the contribution that we each uniquely make. Um, so from the executive team, down through the players, down through the history of the team, stemming from, you know, those ideals that we had to, um, we had to bring to life in sport karate, which were a reflection of uh, Paul Mitchell corporate, you know, it's, we, we're not perfect, but, you know, we do the best we can. Who yeah. is? Yeah, Who is? for sure. I, for I, sure. I, I, I know we're running up against time here, and, and I, I'm so glad that, that we've been able to talk about this. But you promised us one thing, and I, I just want to make sure we go there before we sure. close up. And that was confusion around the name. The idea of, of you know, it's it's Sean Paul, it's Paul Mitchell, John Paul Mitchell, JPM, yeah. right? So yeah, and at the end up for us. For sure, at the end of the first year, we got message that Paul Mitchell had passed away. And, oh my God. Uh, you know, first of all, what a heartbreak. And second of all, 
you know, a distant second for sure, but we don't have a team anymore. Uh, the team member, Steve Babcock, knew. You know, we didn't know. There's, there's two people. So Paul Mitchell, who the company is named after, is uh, died of pancreatic cancer in 1989. John Paul DeJoria, who most people would recognize as the face of Paul Mitchell, mm -hmm. he's the gentleman with the ponytail and, you know, kind of that iconic look. He was the one that rented the space from Steve Babcock, or, you know, rented Steve Babcock the space, and, and he had the relationship there. John Paul is now... Uh, Chairman Emeritus at, at Paul Mitchell, and now his da his daughter Michaeline runs the company. But I think out of a source of respect and, and pride uh, for the team and, and her father's wishes, you know, we remain and and the company has changed. Uh, they they do not sponsor uh, sports anymore. They they don't have a sports marketing division anymore. Everything has been reallocated, you know, with the advent of, you know, social media doing what it does. And, you know, companies always have to reposition themselves, if, you know. Um, of course. But we were the first and, and, and we remain. And like I said, we're going into our 38th year. And, uh, you know, it's exciting. I, I should also note that though I was on the team at the end of year one, I'm one of those unique people. I took 12 years off in between. Um, I retired after I won the world championship and put my total focus into personal best and then had a midlife crisis and said, you know what, I want to come back and try to, you know, do it again. So there was 12 years that I was absent from the team. Um, so, you know, again, I go back to our founder and our, you know, our two co-founders, I mean, they deserve the lion's share of the respect. They've truly been there from, from day one all the way through. And uh, I think if I do a good job, I think it's, it's the inspiration that they give and, you know, the other coaches give. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I, I, I'm glad that I got to put some more pieces into the puzzle for, for my understanding of a team that I grew up on the competitive circuit watching yeah. and looking up to and, and realizing, you know, I, I was a good competitor. Sure. I was never going to be a Paul Mitchell competitor. And I knew that, but that didn't change my admiration. And it doesn't change my admiration today for the folks that, you know, we get to talk to. And, and those of you in the audience who have been around a while, you know, we've had, I think we've had well over a dozen past and present competitors mm -hmm. on the team. And it's just, mm -hmm. it's great to see anything that, that increases the exposure of martial arts is something I can get behind. And, and this is another example of that. Yeah. And, you know, if, if somebody asked me, you know, what was your, you know, what was your biggest win or what was your, you know, greatest victory? You know, I would I would say the number one thing I would have to say is being part of Team Paul Mitchell. You know, I can point to memories, but for most of us that have been part of the team, if somebody pinned them down, their greatest accomplishment was, you know, being a part of this fraternity of, you know, some of the most amazing martial artists, you know, of the past almost 40 years and, and what a, what a complete privilege and honor it is.